This is the 17th in a series of lectures on differential geometry. In this lecture, we're interested in trying to understand how submanifolds intersect. Generally speaking, they, when they intersect, they don't uh, intersect along a submanifold. So we want to find a, decent, a criterion that we can calculate with that will ensure that they do intersect along a submanifold. Let's start off by trying to put the, um, the implicit function theorem into, uh, into the language of differentials. Um, suppose that we have functions f1 dot dot fp on some manifold, they're smooth functions, and then let's consider the set, let's let s be the set of points at the manifold at which all of them vanish Okay, so the points at which all the functions vanish. Um, and let's suppose um, that for every point in that set, the differentials of the functions uh, at that point um, in the tangent space at that point to our manifold are linearly independent then, in fact, uh, that set uh, contained in M is an embedded submanifold. Embed, sorry, embedded submanifold. And, in fact, we can say what its dimension is. Um, the dimension of M minus dimension of the set is the number of the functions. Um, so it's cut out by uh, P functions and that cuts down dimensions by P. So this is a is a theorem, but it's a very elementary theorem to prove. Um, we simply take any coordinates locally, um, so coordinates x1 dot dot xn on our manifold, and then um, in those coordinates we know that we have a an expression for the differential of each of the functions. Uh, sorry, that um, d f i is um, dfi dxj dxj and so uh, linear independence of these guys and your independent dfis df1 to dfp let's say um, uh, is exactly the same as saying that the matrix um, of uh, dfis dxjs uh, has uh, linearly independent rows And so we can apply the um, the usual uh, implicit function theorem to that. So it's an elementary observation more than really a theorem. Now we can try to make use of this to study uh, constraints of objects by functions. What we're interested in is the idea that if some object is cut out by some equations involving some functions, we want to figure out whether or not the functions have independent differentials. So uh, let's picture a very simple drawing of what constraints might cut out. Um, if we imagine that we have two submanifolds, um, say this one and, and this one, and if they cut across each other at some sort of angle to curve, say, in a plane or on a surface, then if we could see that if we slightly perturbed uh, this one and we slightly perturbed uh, this one, we wouldn't have any trouble uh, with their intersection, it would behave very well. The intersection stays nicely behaved. A nice intersection point here moves to a slightly uh, different intersection point, but not far away. So they still intersect in the same pattern nearby. Um, uh, but there could be trouble if we allow more general uh, objects. So, as I pointed out in the last lecture, if we looked at two circles um, in the plane, we could ask where do they intersect, and as long as they intersect crossing through each other at the intersection points, they're sort of passing through each other at some non-zero angle, then small perturbations of the circles, slightly perturbing them to slightly near nearby circles, they'll still intersect with the same pattern uh, of intersections as they, as they had before, but if they were tangent to one another, that wouldn't work anymore because they would uh, start to uh, either pull apart from one another 
could imagine by just slightly perturbing that picture, you end up with something where they pull apart, or they could push together and end up with two intersection points. So that's the kind of worry we have to, to have in, in thinking about how, how submanifolds intersect. So it's clear that the kind of intersection we want is one where they cut across each other in some non-trivial way. The, um, the co-dimension co -dimension of a submanifold inside some larger manifold is defined to be the difference in dimensions. So we're interested in um, cutting out submanifolds with functions. And what we found was that our really implicit function theorem said that if we had um, differentials, p differentials, the new dependent p functions with independent differentials, then the set of points where they vanished, um, so let's say fi equals 0, uh, is a codimension p if these are linearly independent. Um, and it might not be codimension p otherwise. It might be much worse. Um, so a, um, a conormal uh, s tan and m is a submanifold. A conormal uh, is uh, to s at a point, let's say s dot and s, is um, is a um, uh, some uh, cotangent vector at that point for the ambient manifold, cotangent vector, so that uh, psi is 0 on tangent vectors to s. Remember that a cotangent vector is, an, is a linear function on vectors, and we're asking it vanishes on this guy. And um, we have the obvious observation that if, uh, if f is a function uh, and f is 0 everywhere on s, then the differential of f is conormal. Conormal. Um, intuitively, we imagine that psi is some kind of conormal, is something that points away from the manifold across the submanifold, and we have the submanifold here. Kind of points perpendicularly to the to the tangent space to the submanifold, and that way it's vanishing on the tangent vectors in the submanifold to the submanifold. For want of a of a notation, let's write s perp s naught for the set of conormals at that point. So um, two submanifolds are called conorm are called transverse if they have no conormals in common. So p and q, t and m submanifolds are uh, transverse transverse to one another if they have no no conormals in common no common conormals um, so uh, we can write in our notation that uh, uh, we have a notation for conormals we can just write that we want um, in other words to be transverse is to mean that the conormals at the point intersect the conormals of the other guy at a point, well, no, I should say, no common non-zero conormals. So that should just be the zero vector. The zero vector is a, a covector is, of course, conormal to everything, but not in an interesting way. Now we have a trivial observation uh, gain a theorem, which is completely elementary. P and Q transverse submanifolds, um, let's say embedded uh, submanifolds. Um, implies uh, that P intersect Q is uh, an embedded submanifold. And, and the uh, co-dimension of P intersect Q is the co-dimension of P plus the co-dimension of Q. So co-dimensions are often a bit easier to work with than dimensions. So the, the proof is, is, is very elementary. As you said, it's not hardly a proof at all. P is at least locally the zero locus of some functions, fi i equals 1 to something or other, um, with independent differentials, uh, linearly independent. Um, that's more or less the definition of an embedded submanifold, essentially that it has um, this kind of behavior, uh, that it uh, can be written locally as, as the vanishing locus of some of some a certain coordinate functions in some system of coordinates, and they'll have linearly dependent differentials. Q is also uh, somehow the vanishing of some 
I don't know, let's say GAs, some functions with linear independent differentials at every point, at least locally. Locally, P can be written like this. Locally, Q can be written like this. Um, so the, the conormal then of, of P at that point is the span of these DFIs, and the conormal of Q at that point is the span of these DGAs. Um, they have nothing in common. They don't intersect at all, which means if we put them all together, we get these linear independent factors and these linear independent factors put together, and I'll leave you to convince yourself that that means that if you put if you add them up, you still get, they still remain linear dependent, and so the DFIs and the DGAs all put together, all the DFIs and all the DGAs are, are linearly dependent. That's just some linear algebra. And so as a consequence, we get uh, the following um, surprising phenomenon that, well, of course, the intersection of the two is at least locally where this, where P is the intersection, is the zeros of the Fs, Q is the zeros of the Gs. Uh, the intersection is the zeros of the Fs and the Gs all put together, all the Fs and all the Gs. Uh, but they have linear dependent differentials, and so that's the implicit function theorem. We can make the obvious generalization of this to any finite collection of, of submanifolds, or even infinite collection of submanifolds. We can say that they're transverse. Um, any collection of submanifolds, PI contained in M, are transverse if uh, wherever they intersect, the conormal spaces of any of them intersect at the, at the zero cotangent vector. And so you can make sure that this works for just not just for one submanifold, but for any finite collection of submanifolds. A, a trivial observation that the criterion for being transverse, when we go back to it, uh, they were transverse if wherever they intersected, that's for any point where they intersect, you have to check and see if they have con no conormals in common. These DS and these DGs don't overlap. Uh, as, as uh, therefore, the span of the DS doesn't overlap the span of the DGs. Um, but that only has to be checked at intersection points, and so in particular, if they don't intersect, then they are transverse. So that's um, a sort of a trivial case. P intersect Q is empty implies uh, transverse. And it's actually an important case. So if we look at, at two curves in the plane, um, going back to our simple example, let's say, of, of circles in the plane, they're cut out by equations, and what we're worried about is whether or not the equations have independent differentials. The differential of the of the uh, equation cutting out the um, cutting out the one circle is going to be some uh, some kind of function whose differential points perpendicular. If we think of it as a as a, as a covector, as a perpendicular to the tangent vectors, has to vanish from the tangent vectors that are tangent to the curve. So it goes something like this, and then this green guy has similar picture. And so at these two points, you can see that those vectors turn out to be, those vectors perpendicular to the curves turn out to be linearly independent. If we pick, say, let's say this this one here, the green vector perpendicular to the circle, to the tangent plane, to the tangent lines of the circle, goes something like this, and the red one goes something like that. So you can see that at the two intersection points, and I only have to check there, we only have to check these two intersection points, that the uh, these vectors are you know, these covectors are independent. So that holds as long as they're not a tangent. Uh, the only so the, you know, the only problem for curves in the plane is that the curves could be tangent to each other, maybe like this, as we saw before, or maybe like um, like this. Um, they could be tangent, and that would prevent them from being transverse. And otherwise, they're transverse. One of the general uh, big ideas that we have in differential geometry is that instead of thinking about embedded submanifolds, uh, somehow thought of as actually sort of inside this M sitting there in some some very nice way, um, it's convenient to allow slightly more general objects to allow, instead of embedded submanifolds, to allow things that are uh, somehow given by maps instead of embeddings that might not be um, so smooth maps which might, say, immerse the thing. Uh, so that would allow it to cross through itself. And so, well, we should have made this red as well. So we have some map. So we want to think of it that, oh, sorry, um, this, uh, that we want to think of a, a map as a kind of generalization of a submanifold. A submanifold is a geometric object inside M, but a map had traces out some kind of geometric object inside M. And at least, say, an immersed map is pretty close to being a submanifold. So it's good enough. Um, and so we want to allow always, when we define anything for submanifolds, we want to also allow it for maps. So if we have a map, P, 
to m on that phi. We want to generalize this notion, and we want to generalize the notion of, of transversality. Um, to do that, we need to define what the conormals are for that guy. So uh, given a map, phi takes p to m of manifolds, smooth map of manifolds, and a point p naught and p, we'll say that um, a, uh, a conormal uh, to phi at p naught is, strangely enough, not anything living on p at all. It's actually some uh, psi cotangent vector on the ambient space, which represents a constraint that the map satisfies. So, in other words, it should be some th some sort of constraining thing, but it's it ceases to constrain when you pull back to p um, because the constraint is satisfied there. So that's the intuition, and it means, in other words, that it should be a, a cotangent vector on m on the on the image space, so that it pulls back to zero here. So, for example, if I took at this point here, if I took this cotangent vector, you can think of it as being perpendicular to the tangent space, um, the tangent line to the curve, and then at the corresponding point somewhere back, um, say maybe that point corresponds to this point back here, that green vector, cotangent vector, this psi, will pull back to zero on p because it pulls back to something that, that agrees with its, its cal calculations on the tangent vectors. You take a tangent vector here, push it forward, it'll land at a tangent plane, a tangent line, and so it'll be perpendicular to psi, you'll get zero. So that's um, why we'd make that be the notion of conormal. It really does correspond to the notion of conormal in the case of um, of, uh, of an embedded submanifold, where the map phi is just the inclusion of the, of the submanifold S into M. So that gives us the right notion. Now we want to see that we can get the, the same theorem. Let's just see if we can calculate an example to make it clear what we're doing um, so that we're actually working out um, explicitly with computed example so we're not confused about what the uh, conormals are. So let's make a map that goes to u, v, w variables from x and y variables, x, y, and z variables. Um, by, sorry, just x and y variables. I'll follow my example and my notes. Um, so uh, so it's going to take, this is going to take the pull index y plane to a three-dimensional u, v, w space. So it should intuitively draw something like a surface in it. Um, and it'll be defined by requiring that u is going to be x, v is going to be x, y, and w is going to be x squared. So a very simple example of a map where we can explicitly differentiate it. Now, um, if u is x, then of course du is taking d, just dx. And dv, uh, v is xy, so dv is d of xy, which satisfies the, d satisfies the Leibniz rule uh, from, because d is calculated using, uh, by using partial derivatives, so it satisfies the Leibniz rule that's just um, y dx plus x dy. It's probably a good idea to get comfortable with taking d of various functions. Um, and you know how to do it. You know that dv in, in the abstract theory should be uh, v's derivative with regard to x dx plus dot 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 the for y and z. So you calculate it out and get this. And once you're comfortable with it, you start to realize that you can see some simple rules for calculating d on various functions. So product rule is helpful here. Product rule is also helpful for the other one. The w is x squared, so dw is d of x squared, and just like usual calculus, that's 2x dx. Okay, so we know how to calculate all the all the um, differentials of the u's, v's, and uh, w's in terms of the x's, y's, and z's. So that means we can pull back um, differentials to differentials. So if we take any differential, psi is a du plus b dv plus c dw. At some point here, this is where our psi will live in the output space, u's, v's, w's. The inputs are x's, y's. Um, there's our psi, and then um, we need uh, exactly to uh, for for psi to pull back to zero. Uh, we need psi to pull back to zero. That's what it means to be a conormal, to be in phi perp at some point x, y, uh, z.
Oh, sorry, x, y. Um, so to be in, in the normal means it pulls back to 0. But what does it pull back to? Xi is a times, we know what du is. We worked out du is just dx plus b times dv. And dv was y dx plus x dy. And then plus c times dw. And dw pulls back to be 2x dx. And so I can spell it all out and get a plus b y plus 2 uh, c x dx plus, now my dy comes from here, b x dy, and then, oh, there is no, yeah, there's nothing else. Okay, so it's just that. Okay, so, um, so c is uh, co-normal, c equals a du plus b dv plus c dw is co-normal if and only if we have these equations that to be satisfied a plus by plus 2cx is 0 and bx is 0. You can see then that these are two independent equations except when x is 0. So away from x is 0 this thing has two uh, independent equations on the conormals, so only a one-dimensional space of conormals. And that means that we're looking at a surface. But at x equals zero, it's rather bad, so we would expect trouble. We expect that something terrible is happening. Um, at the origin, um, for example, uh, so x, y is zero, um, you're looking at um, conormals. So conormals are c equals, well, if x and y is 0, then b can be anything. And then x and y is 0, a has to be 0. So it's just a is, is uh, 0. Um, so then b can be anything. And then c can be anything. So it's just exactly the conormal space at 0, 0 is the span of dv and dw. The confusing bit is that we're working at the xy origin, but we're saying that the conormals live in the image point. xy origin, uh, x and y both being set to zero, that gets mapped to the origin in the uvw space, and these are differentials at that, spell, that point, at the origin in uvw space. These are the are, are, um, covectors evaluated there. Okay, so let's see um, what we can do about trying to get um, an, an implicit function theorem type of argument going here. Um, so we'll look at um, maps of two different submanifolds to the same manifold. They're uh, transverse. If they have no uh, common um, non-zero conormal. Um, so that's the, the, the obvious notion. Um, so and then uh, what we want to um, say is that this should give us an implicit function theorem. Now of course an obvious situation where you wouldn't have a common conormal is if they don't their images don't overlap. Right? So for example if uh, phi of p uh, uh, intersects c of q only in the empty set then uh, they're transverse. Um, so that checks out. It only, it's only at points where they overlap, where, where one, uh, the image of the one map hits the image of the other map, where you have to check these conditions. The po there's a possibility of having a common conormal. Now, um, it's convenient to define, if you have a map, phi takes p to m, of manifolds of any dimensions. Um, it's, de co it's convenient to define the co-dimension of the map to be the dimension of m minus the dimension of p. That generalizes the nice case where, where it's actually a, where p is actually a submanifold of m. But it generalizes it in a funny way, because it could be negative. Um, uh, so co-dimension is not like dimension. Dimension can't be negative, but co-dimension can. So now I want to um, state uh, a, an implicit function type theorem here, uh, which is simply that um, if we have uh, phi takes P to M smooth uh, smooth map, uh, and if we have um, uh, Q contained in M, an embedded submanifold, uh, 
then uh, phi inverse q, the, Im the image inside p, the stuff in p that maps to q, uh, is embedded. Well, oh, and sorry, and um, uh, and it's transverse to smooth. This has to be transverse oops, uh, to some embedded some manifold q. In other words, transverse for the for the inclusion mapping of Q sitting inside this guy. Then this uh, contained in P is is a, uh, an embedded submanifold. Submanifold uh, and uh, its dimension uh, of phi inverse Q is the expected dimension. It's just uh, well, it's um, co-dimension is the sum of the co-dimensions. So it works out neatly even if the co-dimension happens to be negative. Right, so how do we prove this? Um, the proof is actually not too bad um, because it's really local on the manifold P we're trying to map in. We only have to do it little little open sets on, on P. So. Um, so the proof is basically pretty simple. What we do is we take some, uh, after replacing P by an open subset, we can assume that we have uh, coordinates uh, on M because we can make the little chunk of P so small that uh, that it maps into a coordinate neighborhood in M, the, the domain of some coordinate chart. And then once we can prove it locally, then we can prove it uh, globally because it's made out of little pieces. Of, they're all nice embedded submanifolds of the expected dimension, all overlapping in embedded submanifolds of the expected dimension. So it's really a local problem. And we can always find coordinates so that Q is given by setting various, uh, various x's to 0. Uh, so it's just given by the equation setting various of these to zero. And so you could think of it then that if effectively M uh, is an open subset of some vector space, some Rn, and that Q is um, is just um, uh, the part of the vector space, well, the part of some subspace that lies inside here. Uh, w contained V is a linear subspace. Um, why? Because you set a bunch of variables to zero, you get a linear subspace of a vector space. So we could think of it that way. Um, this enables us to to then uh, it, it's, it just without without any serious loss of generality, just just take the case M is V, uh, Q is W. So in other words, uh, Q contained in M is a linear subspace of a vector space of a finite dimensional vector space. Now, uh, of course, in rea reality we have to actually work with open subsets as such, but the, the argument's essentially the same. Um, so then we can take pi takes m to m mod q, the quotient map of linear uh, of vector spaces. Um, then you can check that transversality, um, what's the transversality condition? The transversality condition of, of our map from p with this sub, uh, with this um, submanifold q is exactly that, um, so phi takes p to m is transverse to q exactly. I'll let you check that exactly. Then you take differentials and see when they when they work out. The differentials of the various x's that are that were set to zero and so on. This is just exactly that um, uh, that uh, this projection map composed with phi has derivative at some point at the points, associated points of P, uh, linear uh, surjection. Um, but then once we have a linear surjection, we know that we recognize that from the, from the old um, uh, rank theorem or from the implicit, from the implicit function theorem. So, uh, so then, um, so then phi inverse Q um, is pi composed phi inverse of zero is an embedded submanifold. Uh, it's an embedded submanifold um, by the old implicit function theorem um, that we had many uh, many lectures ago, um, and so you can and then with a bit of linear algebra you work out the dimensions. Roughly speaking, what we've done really here is to say that we have some some m some manifold. Well, I think a chunk of it is being a big block like this, and then we have some uh, q, which is some kind of Submanifold that's sitting inside this little piece of it, and then um, and then our map P uh, 
is taking some p, our map phi takes this p to something like this, and um, which we imagine sort of passing through q. So here's q and here's p. And what we've really done is to say, well, if you compose with the projection map, this map pi, then the q just becomes a point, and then the map here becomes a map to the plane. And then the transversality needs only to be checked in this thing rather than in this thing. Um, and then it becomes the usual implicit function theorem. Now we can we can put together our most uh, ambitious and sophisticated version of the of the story, um, which is what if we have two maps? Um, so we can say uh, um, that if we have uh, uh, phi takes p to m and uh, c takes q to m transverse, so no uh, conormals in common, then um, we define the fiber product. can always be defined even if they're not transverse. We can simply define it to be P cross over MQ is the usual notation. It's the set of all pairs, a point of the manifold P, point of the manifold Q, so in P cross Q, such that phi of P is C of Q. We have to understand the points at which they overlap, right, at which they map to the same place. So we're interested in where um, one manifold uh, uh, P, or one, it's a P is a map, really, so a phi, a map of P to M, which has some image, and then we have some uh, C takes some um, manifold into here, and we're interested in where those things overlap. So we definitely have to understand this fiber product. It's definitely part of, this part of the picture. However we thought about it, we'd always have to think about where do the two overlap? Where do they hit into each other? The, the C map and the phi map, where do they hit? They hit each other when they're, they're equal at some point of P. They're equal to uh, this guy hits the same point as this guy does at some point of Q. And um, so it's obvious we'd have to study this object. Um, now, um, the proof turns out to be uh, fairly elementary. Um, um, it turns out that it's, um, oh, maybe I should say it's not only, oh, so I didn't, I didn't state, let's say, um, then I need to state what the statement of the theorem is. The fiber product um, sits inside the product as an embedded submanifold. Uh, and um, so, uh, and its um, and its co-dimension uh, inside there is equal to the sum of the co-dimensions of the maps. Okay, so um, so that's the result we want to prove, and let's begin the proof. The proof turns out to reduce right back to the one we already had by a very easy trick. We just think of every map as a graph. So if I have a map, this map has a graph, um, a phi, it's the set of pairs, let's say P, phi of P, um, and it's such that P's in P, and it's of course contained in P cross M. So every map has a graph, and that graph is going to be some submanifold, and that's all we do. So I won't go in through this in great detail. It's not very interesting. It's hard to write down the notation. That seems to be the most difficult part of this proof, really, to write down the notation. So I'm going to let m prime be defined to be, let's say, p cross q cross m. And then p prime will be um, defined to be the set of p, q, m in there, such that m is so the graph of the one guy. And then similarly, um, we get a graph of the other guy. I'm going to put them inside P cross Q cross M for, for simplicity of notation. But uh, this guy's PQ prime is going to be the graph. Uh, it's PQM such that, um, so P of PQ and Q, M and M such that uh, M is C of Q. So it's the graph of C essentially. And then um, and then we apply the, the technique as given. Um, so they apply the previous result. And it's not terribly hard to check by writing everything out that it works, that in fact um, uh, that uh, the various submanifolds are in fact uh, transverse and so on and so forth. So I won't um, worry about 
uh, filling in all the details for the proof there, but that's really the idea of it. When you have um, uh, maps, you think about their graphs, and when you um, when you uh, uh, want to generalize submanifolds, you think of them uh, think of them as maps. So, so you know, if we have this picture that embedded submanifold is a nice thing to think about, but we could generalize it to only things like immersed submanifolds, which you've seen before. Um, they were slightly worse than embedded submanifolds, so we want to think of immersed submanifolds as, as almost submanifolds. And when we have to deal with them, sometimes we think about the graph of the map, so we think of, of, the, of the immersed submanifold as really being um, given by a map. Um, and, um, and then we can think about the graph of that map when we get an embed back to the world of embedded submanifolds. And that's the fundamental trick that applies here. The motivation for thinking about this transversality is that we want to imagine, as, as before, that we had some some uh, sort of submanifolds or something like that. Um, we're studying uh, submanifolds or maps, um, and maybe m most places, maybe they typically they want to behave transversely. But what if they don't? What happens if they don't behave transversely? What we'd like to do is to slightly perturb them and make them transverse by small perturbation. That's going to be a major idea. Um, so in our next lecture, we're going to think about um, the problem of uh, uh, how uh, how rare it is, uh, how rare is it for maps to have sort of bad behavior or to have, more precisely, to have, sort of criti have critical points. And we want to show that this is somehow, in some sense, rare and so um, can be avoided uh, by some sort of perturbations. So we're really sort of trying to perturb things away from, from bad behavior, which is exactly what we've run into here. Bad behavior we'd like to get rid of by perturbation. So we need to understand is how, uh, do, how uh, do we get some control over um, what happens when we allow ourselves to slightly perturb things.